I've always been more of a Marvel guy when it came to the comics, but with the movies, I was all DC. Their movies weren't just better. They were usually the only ones being made. That changed with Blade. Marvel started selling off the film rights to their big hitters, and we got the X-Men, Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, the Hulk, and it just kept coming. Meanwhile, DC could barely get movies off the ground. We got Jonah Hex, The Losers, Constantine, but not the movies we really wanted. They tried with Superman Returns, but that movie didn't really go well. It was tied down by trying to be the Donner films, and then there was that whole super kid thing. Where DC nailed it, though, was with Batman Begins. It's a movie that really shouldn't have worked, but under Christopher Nolan's direction, it did. And he did it with a simple theme. A fantasy made real. Final Fantasy fans might recognize that line. It's a tagline to the trailer for the game that would become Final Fantasy XV. The idea was to ground the fantasy in the real world. For something like Final Fantasy, this would mean changing how technology works and adding in fantasy creatures to the normal world. For something like Batman, it's playing with how such a person would really exist. Now, Nolan didn't do this exactly. What he gives you is the hyper-real. This allowed him to play with the Batman mythos without being tied down by the silly. Batman Begins was a hit, but where Nolan really soared was with The Dark Knight, the best live-action superhero film, and until Logan, the only recent one worthy of an Oscar nod. The acting, the directing, the score, the cinematography, all top-notch. Had it been a crime drama instead of a superhero flick, it'd probably be taught in film school. But it had a bigger impact than that. The movie grossed $1 billion. And this was before the 3D craze. That's $1 billion in standard theaters with a handful of IMAX showings. That money played into Disney's push to buy Marvel. It also convinced many other studios that the best way to make a superhero film was to make it dark. Literally, in most cases. This should have been the stepping stone for DC's resurgence. But they couldn't get anything off the ground. Meanwhile, in the four years between The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises, Marvel pumped out two sequels, launched Captain America, and set up the first Avengers film. By the time DC finally got its act together and had a Superman film ready, the Marvel method was already established, and people expected to see some major universe building in Man of Steel. So of course, Warner Brothers screwed that up. Their first mistake was trying to get Nolan to guide the new cinematic universe. Warner Brothers really liked that fantasy made real tone from the Nolan films. They tried very hard to get Nolan to act as their Feige and Whedon, guiding the new DC cinematic universe. They also tried to get Christian Bale to come back as Batman. Nolan wanted no part of the big universe thing, and Bale would only come back if Nolan did, so both of them were out. Nolan did agree to act as a producer for Man of Steel, and had a great deal of input into the film. This is arguably why the film works, and why it's the best of the current DC films. Warner Brothers' second mistake was hiring Zack Snyder. Now as much as I like Dawn of the Dead, 300, and Watchmen, Snyder simply was a wrong choice for the fantasy made real theme. He's great at action set pieces and has a fantastic eye for what looks cool, but he sucks at character development, unless it's already in the script. And the script didn't help him here, because it was written by David Goyer. Goyer wrote the Nolan Batman films, however Nolan was there to fix one of Goyer's major problems. Unfinished story beats. He loves to set up a conflict and end that conflict, but he doesn't like to show the in-between needed to give the resolution some meaning. We see this in Man of Steel a lot. Jonathan tells Clark that maybe he shouldn't save people, and then we see Clark saving people, but we never get why he does it. Another big one was Clark killing Zod. The closest setup we get is the bullying scene, but we never get why Clark wouldn't want to kill Zod, or why he would be so devastated afterwards. Nolan would have cleaned that up by adding in a few scenes to help the audience understand things. Snyder, on the other hand, just went with it because he was more interested in Clark's Should I Be a Hero journey and awesome action set pieces. I really do have to give Snyder credit though because he not only made Superman move like he does in the comics, but also like he did in the old Fleischer Brother cartoons. But that's also one of Zack Snyder's problems. He's a fanboy. An uber fanboy. And he just can't shut that off. Nolan was able to tap that down a little in Man of Steel, so that all that we really see are lots of easter eggs setting up other DC characters like Hamilton, The Guardian, and Star Sapphire. In Batman vs Superman, Nolan isn't there to keep this contained, and Snyder blows his fanboy load in every crevice of the film. 
Ironically, despite being an uber fanboy, Snyder failed to properly set up the broader DC universe. Instead of allowing older heroes to exist, Superman was the only hero ever. This would be fine if all the future characters would be new like Superman, but then Batman vs Superman throws that all out by showing Batman and Wonder Woman existing, with Wendy for a hundred years. And just when you think it couldn't get worse, in comes Batman vs Superman, Dawn of Justice. The problem actually began with the destruction porn at the end of Man of Steel. During the final fight, Zod and Superman wrecked the city. At no point during the fight does Superman try to save anyone. We don't exactly see people die, but it's obvious that scores of them do. Fans reacted badly to that, and Superman killing Zod, and Superman's general lack of happiness. This wasn't the Superman they were looking for. Now, the smart thing to do would be to fix this in Man of Steel 2. Show a Superman who's learned from the previous events, who goes out of his way to save people. Show him mellowing out, beginning to feel more part of the world. When the major fight happens at the end of the film, have it play into his need to save people. It'd be even better if some people die because he has to choose who to save because he can't be everywhere. These are the basic things they could have done. Instead, Warner Brothers panicked and allowed Snyder to set up the new Batman in the next film. Okay, fine. Batman could be an urban legend. Have him show up and help Superman in the fight. Oh, hell, they're going to fight each other. Seriously. Warner Brothers' response to the Avengers franchise was to let Zack Snyder make The Dark Knight Returns, as the second film, before setting up the bigger universe. Why? Why? No, really, why? And just to make it even more ridiculous, Snyder kept adding characters. Wonder Woman, Cyborg, Flash, Aquaman. You know you've only got two and a half hours for this movie, right? How are you going to introduce all these characters while giving Supes and Bat a plausible reason to fight? The answer is, he couldn't, and he didn't. I didn't hate Batman vs. Superman. I liked it, but there are so many scenes. The nightmare scene, the time travel scene, the Wayne's death, and the entire third act that just didn't need to be in this film. Had it stuck to Clark's story and him finding out that he's not the only one running around in a super suit, that would have been better. Instead, we got the first act of Man of Steel 2, half a Batman film, large chunks of The Dark Knight Returns, the death of Superman in his second film, random Wonder Woman, and cameos from the rest of the Justice League. Oh yeah, Luther also contacted Stephen Wolf. If all that wasn't bad enough, the head of Warner Brothers ordered 30 to 45 minutes to get chopped out of the film. Since there weren't any major plot points Zack Snyder could cut, all the connective scenes took the hit, resulting in characters doing things completely without context. When the director's cut came out, the film played much better and received better reviews, with many of them saying the longer cut should have gone to theaters. Ah, but Warner Brothers' woes were only beginning. They'd already greenlit and started shooting Suicide Squad, which was due to come out months after Batman vs. Superman, and they'd already started production on Wonder Woman and Justice League. The studio had just enough time to re-edit and do a few pickups for the Suicide Squad to add in humor, since the comedy routine was working so well for the Marvel films. Suicide Squad initially hit big, with most of the audience liking it while the critics hated it, but the love wore off after some time. Warner Brothers had a little trouble with Wonder Woman's production, but it ultimately came out to glowing praise from fans and critics alike, as if the critics would ever denounce a film directed by a woman about a woman. But the support didn't bleed over to Justice League. The studio just couldn't leave the movie or Zack Snyder alone. Even though Snyder had taken the blame for Batman vs Superman, which in fairness is largely his fault, the studio didn't trust Snyder at the helm. Of course, these folks knew this going back to Man of Steel, so they should have just brought in someone else to direct the Justice League films. Instead, they gave them to Snyder, who pictured a two-part film showcasing Darkseid, the resurrection of Superman, and the Justice League finally being on the silver screen. Then they took it from him midway through the production. They brought in Joss Whedon, who had led the Marvel films to success with the Avengers, to rework the script and then reshoot large portions of Snyder's film. Bringing in Whedon was a slap in the face for two reasons. One, because the studio was firing Snyder mid-production when they already knew before pre-production began they didn't really want him. Two, because these directors' styles couldn't be more different and no amount of editing will make them gel. The result was a complete mess of a film that can't decide whether it wants to be serious, funny, super dark, or fan service. And then the studio decided to dick over Whedon by chopping out an hour out of the final cut of the film just so the film would have more showtimes. 
By butchering an already disjointed film, the studio made Justice League a chore to watch and damn near impossible to really enjoy. It had good moments, but nothing is ever solid, especially with the constant tone shifts. This leaves Warner Brothers with a total mess of a franchise universe. Without a major change, which would be hard to do in the current universe, they will be stuck trying to even out all the wrinkles in the mess Zack Snyder created and what they worsened with their constant meddling. But what should they have done? Well, for starters, they should have stuck with the fantasy made real theme. This actually works well with the DC characters because everyone already knows them. You don't really need to explain Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, or Aquaman. This gives you enough room to play with their lore, and the best way to do that is to play it like these people really existed. How would the world react? What impact would it really have? How would this affect the characters? Man of Steel actually nails the fantasy made real, and so did Wonder Woman, at least when she got to the modern world. That tone, treating them just as people with powers, keeps the characters grounded. That's the step Warner Brothers should have followed. They also shouldn't have got caught up in big CGI battles or clunky third acts that turn into destruction porn. The Dark Knight's final scene is on a ledge with five people and is far more powerful than anything from the recent DC films. The other thing WB should have done was properly set up the DC Universe. There's a scene in Man of Steel where a young Clark has a red blanket tied around his neck and stands in the classic superhero pose. Okay, fine. But where would he have learned that if he's the first superhero? It'd be better to establish that he's the first superpowered hero, and that other characters like Batman are treated as urban legends at best. That way you at least have some groundwork to build a legacy on. Another thing would be to build the world by having each new character play a role in the film. So in Man of Steel 2, at the end of the film, we get this Tim Burton style pan up. It's night, we see soups hovering over the Sears Tower since Metropolis is Chicago. Maybe it's about to storm, we get a lightning flash, and then the bat signal appears in the sky. And then you cut the film. That's it. You end it right there. No teaser at the end, no tag, nothing. That's it. Then you do the next film, The World's Finest, and have Batman in it, along with Luther and Joker as the villains. Then you do your Wonder Woman cameo towards the third act. And Batman could say to Supes, who'd be surprised to see another superpower being, what, you thought you were the only one? Then you do your Batman film, and you can bring in the Flash. Keep all the street-level characters with Batman. You do your Wonder Woman film and bring in Aquaman. Keep all the mythological characters with her. Then you do the Justice League film, and fine, you can have Superman die in a fight with Steppenwolf. But in that fight, in space, there's an explosion of yellow light. And a certain alien with a certain ring that's weak against yellow gets hit and knocked down to Earth. Boom, there's your Green Lantern setup. Second JLA movie, you bring in Darkseid, bring back Supes, and in the final battle, Green Lantern comes in to save the day. Then you have your follow-up Green Lantern, Flash, and Aquaman movies. Since everyone's appearing in everyone else's movies, it'll be really easy to build out the universe, and it won't be done in the typical Marvel way. Another thing Warner Brothers should have done was avoid anything used in the CW shows. Using Barry Allen as a Flash instead of Wally West only makes things confusing. Don't use anything tied to the show since they're supposed to be their own universes. Of course, a cinematic crossover would be awesome with that kind of thing. But by far the biggest mistake Warner Brothers made was not bringing in Paul Dini and Bruce Timm to guide the franchise. These two brought us some of the best versions of Batman, Superman, and the Justice League ever. They nailed it with each show they did, getting better and better as they grew the animated universe. They know the characters. They know the lore. They know how to mix in humor with serious stories. These are the guys who should have ran the franchise and had final say. As it stands, the DC Cinematic Universe is a mess. It's kind of fixable, but it's going to take a lot. And I mean a lot of work to fix. Wonder Woman was a good step. Aquaman looks like it might be too. Shazam could be a good bridge as well, but what they really need is to get the big two back in order. Let's get our Man of Steel 2. It's been almost six years now. Are y'all on a Sade schedule or something? Let's fix Batman. I like Affleck, but he's dealing with his personal business right now, so it's time to recast. Get someone who can play an older, hardened Batman, but lose the whole killing people thing. Make these two work, and do a World's Finest film already. I really want the DC films to work because they have the truly iconic characters. Everyone knows who Batman is. Everyone knows who Wonder Woman is. Everyone knows who Superman is. Hell, the S-Shield is one of the most recognized symbols in the world. You don't squander that by making messy films. So Warner Brothers, get your act together. 
You should be tripping over billions of dollars with each film, not fending off negative reviews. But what do I know? I'm just some guy.